Good evening, everybody. My name is Mike Barsanti. I am the Edwin Wolf II Director of the Library Company of Philadelphia. And it is my great pleasure, again, to welcome you to tonight's fireside chat. Um, these chats have been one of the one of the great things to come out of this terrible year for the library company. Um, we love them because it gives us an opportunity to showcase some of our scholars, people who've done work at the library company, who can talk about our collections as well as their other research and all the things that they have learned from us and other places and people. And you know, for me, I think it also helps to really connect right back to the origins of the library company, the learning community that you know was the Junto and the way they would meet together in the evenings to talk about the problems of the day and how history um, was a perspective to take on understanding them. Um, I'm really pleased tonight to that uh, we're joined by Professor Sarah Swedberg. I'm going to say a little bit more about Sarah in a moment, but before I do, I wanted to give you a quick reminder of some other events we have coming up. Um, next week on June 2nd, we're going to have Raina Yancey talking about Black lawyers in Philadelphia, which is um, going to be a really interesting program. Um, and a week from today, we are going to have um, another fireside chat called Creative Confluence in a Peak Poetry World. And that's going to include Orchid Tierney and Jenna Osman talking with Andrea Krupp. Andrea is one of our conservation uh, experts who has curated our new exhibition uh, about coal. So they are going to be talking about last year and poetry and coal, which will be fantastic. Um, but tonight will be fantastic. Um, more importantly, um, I'm really glad to have um, to have Professor Swedberg with us. She is a professor of history at Colorado Mesa University, where she's been since 1999. Um, she is a regular writer for Nursing Clio. Um, her book, Liberty and Insanity in the Age of American Revolution, published by Lexington just in last year in 2020, which she'll be talking about tonight, um, as well as other things, I'm sure. But her book began with a 2011 NEH summer seminar for college and university professors at the library company. So this is one of the books that um, we can uh, claim some influence uh, or involvement in, in some ways. Um, the topic of the seminar was on the prob problem of governance in the early American Republic. And um, I imagine there's a little distance from that topic to uh, what Professor Swedberg will be talking tonight. But uh, without any further, further uh, Ado for me, um, let me welcome Sarah and thank her for talking as part of the series tonight at the Library Company. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you so much for the Library of Company of Philadelphia for welcoming me to the Fireside Chat series. I have, um, I'm on mountain time, so I, I often don't get a chance to watch them until later. Um, I watch the recorded versions rather than the live versions. But I've really enjoyed the chats and I am just so glad in this now year plus of pandemic just to have that connection with um, ideas and scholars and everything else. It's been it's been super hard, as we all know. Uh, and I just finished grading. <laughs> uh, I think I finished Sunday, but it feels like it was just yesterday. So um, I may be a little less sharp than usual. I'm still kind of worn out from this academic year. Uh, but this is a project that started at the library company in 2011, and it actually didn't stray so far from the problem of governance in the early American Republic. The seminar was led by um, Mike Morrison and John Larson at Purdue, and for three weeks, a cohort of scholars met in the library company in the um, in the house there, um, Cassatt House, and talked about a core group of readings, but we also all came with our own research projects. My research project was not yet very clearly defined, but I've had a really long standing interest in the history of mental illness. Um, and so came in with a very badly defined project, but began working on it. And I really began by reading some of the 18th and 19th century medical texts held in the library company's collections. 
And it was there that I gained the first point of entrance into what became my book project. Since I was immersed in the readings and discussions on the problem of governance, the first things that really jumped out at me, and I, this was probably three or four days into reading, that really made me sit up and say, wow, I, I think I can make this work, came from Dr. Johann Spurzheim. So Spurzheim in his book, uh, uh, one of his books about insanity, referenced the American doctor Benjamin Rush and others and argued that insanity was most prevalent in England because in England, there was a lot of liberty. There was choice, there was contention. He wrote, here everything finds opposition and opposition naturally excites the feelings. So protest and party politics and um, debates over religion, the doors open to accumulating wealth or losing all of your wealth. All of these excited the cerebral function and made some people lose their minds. In the version that I read, which was the first American version, there was also a little asterisk and a footnote. And at the bottom, it said, these truths are also applicable to the United States. And so I thought, ah, here, here, here is the, the center of my project. Um, the copy from which this came also included an appendix by the American doctor, Amariah Brigham, and in a way that probably made me very inappropriately laugh out loud in the reading room. <laughs> uh, Brigham took exception with Spurzheim's contention that England had the largest number of insane people. In a fit of pique, he explained a particular form of American exceptionalism that Americans were far more likely to go insane than their English counterparts. And he devotes pages and pages and pages to trying to uncover the comparative numbers between the United States and England and Scotland and a few other places as well. And then he calls it this terrible disease, but he also seems kind of proud that because the United States has the most liberty in his mind, that it also has the most insanity. So that was really the, where I started the project, and I'll, I'll come back to that in just a minute. Um, I'm going to jump forward for a minute because about half of my book is pre-revolution revolution, and then the second half is post-revolution through the end of the first Washington administration. Um, and so the other thing that in reading um, medical texts or lectures, was that in the aftermath of the American Revolution and in the midst of the French Revolution, of course, Benjamin Rush took this argument one step further and worried not just about the liberty, but about revolution as well. He wrote about what he called a new species of insanity, anarchia. The excess of the passion for liberty inflamed by the successful issue of the war produced in many people opinions and conduct which could not be removed by reason nor restrained by government. And so he argued that the tumult of the revolution together with liberty had really further added to the danger. So throughout the three weeks of the seminar and for the next year or so, I thought that was going to be the focus of my book particular tension between liberty and insanity. The questions I started with were things like, how could politicians and state makers balance their desire for governments that centered liberty with the fact that those very governments caused insanity? Rush, of course, wrote specifically about that. Um, and so both through the revolution and then as the United States emerged from the American Revolution, what I found was that Americans really agonized about the possible failure of their experiments in, the gover in government, and they tied that to insanity. The new systems that arose during and after the war emphasized the social compact, linking the individual and the government very explicitly. And we see this in the state constitutions. For instance, the 1780 Massachusetts Constitution states that the body politic is formed by a voluntary association of individuals. It is a social compact by which the whole people covenants with each citizen and each citizen with a whole people that all should be governed by certain laws for the common good. 
but this relationship necessitates rationality. If you have this covenant between the people and the government, the whole people and the individuals, it's not going to work if you have insane people in positions of power. In his 1794 medical dissertation on insanity, Edward Cutbush wrote that an uninterrupted use of reason is absolutely necessary for the well beings of all societies, both civil and religious. People needed to be rational enough to understand their positions and to occupy them fully according to the norms. If they didn't, they created really dangerous situations for themselves, their families, communities, and even the Republic. Lunatics, as they were often called, were incapable of this kind of rationality. And so for many Americans, fears about lunatics intersected with anxiety over the health of their community and their nation. So as Americans worried about lunatics, they also employed the language of insanity or lunacy, calling their opponents crazy or madmen in attempts to discredit them. 18th century writers or speakers in letters and diaries and pamphlets and speeches repeatedly drew lines between opponents by claiming rationality for themselves and those who believed like them and irrationality for their political opponents. And of course, this is something that we still do. Um, the, the, the process of writing this book was really interesting because I began to hear all the times that I say, oh, he's crazy or, or that's insane. Right, we still do that and we still use it as a political tool as well. I am uh, in, uh, my, my representative to Congress is Lauren Boebert and her, I haven't checked recently, but it, as of January, her website called the rest of us left-wing lunatics, right? So she's still working on that division between us and them using that language. So this has a long history. But as I focused on that language, that language of using insanity to make political divisions, I became more and more troubled in ways that I've never been troubled by teaching some of the same material. I've been teaching since 1997, and only in writing this book have I re-examined really deeply some of what I teach. And the reason for that is because people use that rational, irrational dichotomy to justify violent acts against their opponents. And I write about several of these. One of them is before the American Revolution, the Paxton volunteers in their so-called apology claim that they were acting very rationally when they slaughtered peaceable Conestogas and that they had to respond because the Pennsylvania government was acting irrational, ir irrationally for making alliances with the Conestogas in the first place. Same with a lot of the protests that I have taught about for decades now, things like the Stamp Act protests where Anglo-American protesters claimed that things like tarring and feathering their opponents or property destruction were rational reactions to the irrational acts of parliament. So that was one line of inquiry and that really remained one of the, the things that ties my book together. The second came out of actually a conference experience where a colleague of mine who teaches literature asked me to participate in a panel about captivity narratives. And I said, well, I, I have a particular kind of captivity narrative that I'd like to talk about. And those, that is people who are in an age of liberty, confined for insanity, whether or not they're actually insane. And that conference paper, paper really blossomed into another question that kept me thinking about that tension between liberty and insanity throughout the book. The first draft of that that I wrote focused on the story of Captain John McPherson, who was a wealthy privateer who had settled in Philadelphia. 
in May of 1769, he was seized in his the garden of his um, estate. He was put into a mad shirt, a straight jacket. He was taken into one of his outbuildings and he was chained against his will for three months before he regained his freedom. One of the things that makes the story really interesting is that one of the people who decided that he was insane enough to be confined was John Dickinson. And of course, at this point, Dickinson is kind of Mr. Liberty. He is, he is writing a lot in ways that make Americans think deeply about liberty and the ways that parliament may be taking their liberty away. Now, Dickinson claimed that McPherson was so deranged by a fever that this was a necessary step for his own safety and the safety of his family. Now, I actually don't know whether or not McPherson was dangerously insane. I suspect his wife was made very nervous by his behavior. There are later letters from one of his sons that, to a friend that are kind of like, mm, dad's a little crazy, not in those words, of course, which makes me think that at some points he was not in his right mind. But that matters less for my story. What is really important for my story are the questions that McPherson asked. They are really the 18th century questions that a lot of people are asking. He claimed he had never been mad. And he asked, what did it mean for both himself and the body politic if my unhappy story becomes precedent in these young countries? Where will then the liberty we pretend to contend for, where will then be the liberty we pretend to contend for when the hands of doctors and divinity and physic are the only persons entrusted to them? McPherson's story actually ended up being at the very end of my chapter one. The early, earlier pages of that chapter really dig into both true life and fictional accounts, both in England and in North America of people confined for insanity. And they show how prevalent those questions were. In an age of liberty, when is it okay to take somebody's liberty away? And who gets to decide? It is the same question that people are asking on all different levels. So we see variations of this question when, for instance, those who don't want to follow the Continental Association refuse but are targeted for violence or other forms of punishment because that. Who gets to decide? It's not a legal body. Who gets to decide that their liberty is being taken away? When the Quakers follow their religious conscience and refuse to support the military efforts that come with a war, who gets to decide that their liberty is being taken away? So that is one of the really important questions that, again, threads its way throughout the book. The last point of access into what I thought about and what I wrote about is the relationship between health and illness in physical bodies and illness in the body politic. As most of you probably know, 18th century Anglo-Americans believed that their society and government operated much the same as physical bodies. The body politic was born, it aged, it could even die. It was also susceptible to disease, fever, cancer, and mental illness. Because of this, the language of illness in the body politic is everywhere in libraries and archives. This was probably what I spent the most time on is just digging through archival records to find those references, those medical metaphors that tied the body politic to mental or physical illness. So in the midst of protest, in the midst of military and political conflict, men and women looked around them and they used that same language of humors and other forms of medicine to make diagnoses in the body politic. 
these were usually negative. Every once in a while, there's a, a positive one. So I just want to tell you a story about one positive one. So William Hooper had come to Philadelphia for what became the Second Continental Congress, and he's writing home. And, and he and the other delegates are looking at all of the military preparation that's going on in Philadelphia. And he writes, this city has taken a deep share in the infection, which is so generally diffused through the continent. Men, women, and children feel the patriotic glow. So he uses this infection language, but weirdly, it's not a bad infection. It's a good infection. It's, it's spreading patriotism. But it was more often that people equated problem, problems in government or society with disease in a negative way. From his home in England in 1774, George Cressner wrote to his friend William Knox, I look on the Bostonians as men in a high fever. Bleeding will bring them to their senses. So they had become mad through this fever, but bleeding will bring them to their senses. And he used this medical metaphor, but his bleeding was far from metaphorical. He believed that the British regulars should move to crush the rebellion, rebelling colonists, literally making them bleed even to the point of death. In his mind, a quick and decisive military action would scare the majority of colonists back to mental health. This bleeding could force, as he wrote, the better sort of New Englanders, sick and tired of being governed by the rabble, to realize how dangerous the situation had become and join in to restore rationality and law and order. In a similar way, in 1776, the secretary to Lord Richard Howe, Henry Strachey, witnessed the Battle of Long Island. To Strachey, he, he, is, he just keeps thinking that the Americans are going to give up because there's this nightmare of death. And with the Battle of Long Island, even as some Americans tried to surrender, they were slaughtered. There is retreat. There are high rates of desertion. It seems mad to him. Americans seem set on fighting an unwinnable war. To Strachey, they prove themselves beyond nature and as well as reason. So he writes a series of really wonderful letters to his wife, Jane. On September 3rd, 1776, he writes, I shall hereafter think it possible that a frenzy may seize a whole nation as well as an individual. And by the end of the same month, he writes again, I begin to think it possible that a whole country as well as an individual may be struck with lunacy. With these remarks, Strachey signaled his growing belief that the war would not end in the near future and that reconciliation might not be possible anymore. The madness had spread from the inflamed brains of a few individuals to the mind of the body politic. It would be impossible for sane individuals to prevail because it had gone beyond the actions of any one person and had in, infected the collective. It's also really interesting to me that he uses a whole nation. He seems to be kind of acknowledging, even though he's still saying independence won't necessarily happen, he's still acknowledging a nation to a certain degree. Uh, and one last example to that, to that end, in a sermon to British soldiers, Charles Inglis drew similar conclusions. He told them that nothing could explain the ways Americans were bent, some Americans were bent on independence, other than, quote, astonishing infatuation and madness. Independence loving Americans were mad and had become mad in a number of different ways. And one of the things that's always interesting to me when I was looking at this was how close these sermons and pamphlets and letters paralleled the language of the medical texts. His analysis could have come straight out of a medical text. He said, a wrong bias of mind, inordinate affections and desires, or an overweening opinion of ourselves frequently produce this unhappy temper. So the revolution had created an atmosphere that was ripe for madness, but it didn't end with the war. Despite the fact 
that men like Tom Paine and others had argued that they had the opportunity to create this good rational government, Americans emerged from the war in a very disordered state. And that's a story that's familiar to all of us. Those of us who teach our US history survey take the time to talk about the facts that Americans could more or less come together to wage the war, but then they couldn't agree on what they had wrought in the aftermath. When they looked around, they saw threat everywhere in the aftermath of the war, in the economy, certainly in the political world, in the upheavals in Europe. Every time they saw something change or every innovation led them to fears that their experiment of the United States would not survive long, that irrationality or insanity would overcome the rationality needed for the new social compacts to work. For some, it was the excess of liberty and that's what the textbooks tend to focus on, that the excess of liberty unleashed democratic elements or anarchy that would bring about madness and ruin. But for others, it was the aristocratical tendencies that were also, they believed, present and rising. So regardless on which side of this divide they stood, many Americans agreed with William Samuel Johnson, who was serving in the Confederation Congress in 1785. He wrote that he believed Americans had a strong propensity to run into lunacy and dissipations of every kind. Checking the madness of the people, either democratical or aristocratical, seemed difficult if not impossible, as the new governments moved from peace to war. So my second half of the book really focuses on that post-war era um, and different elements, certainly the rebellions, not just Shay's rebellion, but some of the other rebellions. Um, it looks at the creation and ratification of the constitution. And then, uh, you know, after all the arguments that from people like Madison, this will make things better they can't really figure out immediately how that's supposed to work. And they argue a lot about that. Certainly the, the political parties that are hardened in the 1790s become one of the places where you see a lot of that name calling that those people over there are insane and we're rational. The debates over foreign policy and particularly the debates over the French Revolution for many Americans the French Revolution seemed like a particular form of madness, and they very much worried that that madness would come to the shores of the United States. So through all of that, Americans continued to see their world in part through the lens of medical understanding. Over and over again, people turned to what they knew, and one of the things that they knew was a popular understanding of the workings of health and illness and a desire for a cure. And so I'll leave it at that, and I welcome any questions. Um, that is a really brief overview, <laughs> um, but I certainly have lots of stories that I can tell. Sarah, thank you. That was a that was a, a wonderful presentation. Um, I would, uh, if anyone would like to ask a question, now is the time. Um, if you look down at the bottom of your screen down here, you'll see the little Q and A button. That is the best one to use. Um, we may not see it if you're in the chat, and we are not going to see it if you raise your hand. So, um, if you do have a question, please use that Q and A box in the menu bar across the bottom while people are finding that, Sarah, um, I, I, I just, I found the whole argument about this idea of the body politic and the physical body um, just really compelling and, and, and intriguing. And I wondered like, thinking about that idea, how did, like, were, did you see any kind of attempts to figure, so to speak, the colonial relationship in terms of a body like, you know, I guess you could talk about, you know, was it, uh, to, you know, a, a, like a male and female body? Like, well, how, how does the relationship or the separation between the parts of the colonial body get figured into this body form? 
actually a really good question. I'm not sure I have an answer to that. Um, they, I mean, they just talk about physical bodies all the time. Um, and I, I don't recall off the top of my head one of the places that I might have seen them talking about the colonies as a body part or a colonies as um, certainly when they, they talked about it in the older kind of formation of the body politic, um, the king was the head, right? And the rest was the rest of the body. Um, and I'm sure there's some of that there, but it's not something that I was looking for or necessarily saw. It, as you're saying that, I'm reminded there was a political cartoon, I think attributed to Franklin, that showed the, the body of, I think the body of Great Britain being like sort of cut into, like dismembered. Yeah. yeah. Right, like cut into pieces. It's yeah. probably an illustration in your book. <laughs> no, it's not. But but I know that one. Yeah, where you see the it's it's rather gruesome as a lot of those are with the, the severed, chopped up limbs of the, the body, because I, I think they really did see that that process of dissolving the old body. I guess the old body would have died in the process of packing it to pieces <laughs> and then reforming it in a different way. I mean, it, it is. Is is this a so this this kind of metaphor? Um, is there a connection here to the idea of like the royal body and the the royal body is representing the state and the sort of the great chain of being concept about you know the the king as the head of the head of state. There you go, right? It's yeah. it's yeah. it's all packed in there. Yeah, and I think so. And I think one of the things that um, um the the independence minded um, colonists and then new Americans were doing was reimagine that without, what does that look like without the king at the head? Um, and that's a really, now I'm just in, interested in how they would have visualized that because if you, you're lopping off the head, um, <laughs> do you regrow one? Or I, I think they really just see a new birth of a new body based on the social compact. Um. You have a, a question that's come in from uh, uh, D. Andrews, Doris uh, D. Andrews. Um, she thanks you for a fascinating talk. Um, uh, she says, I remember years ago, many years ago, being annoyed that Bernard Balin used the phrase contagion of liberty uncritically in his masterwork on the revolution. Have you found that historians have a tendency to downplay the issue of mental instability in this way, especially its physical manifestations? Uh, she says she could ask a lot more, especially about January 6th, but we'll leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely think that they see, um, you know, the medical doctors, when they write about mental illness, they are trying to unpack the causes. And of course, these are, in, in some ways, we, we can laugh at them to a certain degree until we also then read the, the diagnostic the DSM, um, which is equally, we still don't have answers, right? But they certainly did believe that one of the things that was possible was a contagion. Um, and there is all this lection, uh, this, sorry, this language of infection or contagion and that liberty can do that like other things. And they do, many people do see it as a mental illness, that this is passing from body to body in a collective way that is undermining stability, undermining law and order, making people act in violent ways over and over and over again. And yeah, the <laughs> I had finished writing this. This came out in, in December of 2020, but watching January 6th was, I mean, it was freaky for all of us, but thinking about this really hard for the last nine years, I thought this is this is in part what people were worried about is this contagion, right? Um, I'm going to try to write a short piece in the next week or so um, for nursing Cleo about foxitis, right? That claim that they were, these insurrectionists were made crazy by watching Fox News, um, but it's not all that different from the ways that we see in the 1790s with the people on the other, the various sides of 
that political divide talking about how the opposition's newspapers, either the opposition pamphlets or the opposition's um, Democratic Republican clubs are creating this contagion uh, that is leading to anarchy and leading to the potential that the Republic will fail. Thank you. Um, Gabriel Loikono has written in two questions. I'm gonna I'm going to put them together. Um, the, Hi, Gabe. He was in that. He was in that seminar with me. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's brilliant! That's awesome. Um, so he starts off by saying, "Did this book change the way you thought about mental illness?" Um, and then goes on to sort of elaborate on a similar theme. Um, he says, "I've noticed that exceptions to the right to vote in the early American Republic include a formulaic list of lunatics." persons non compost mentis and paupers or recipients of poor relief. Are there some commonalities between paupers and lunatics in your thinking, or are they just two categories in the same list? So one, it starts out by asking about the way that you think about mental illness, which, and then the second question is actually quite different, but this distinction yeah. between paupers and lunatics. Yeah, and I'll actually start with the, the second one because a lot of, um, a lot of the language links paupers and lunatics um, together, there is one, and I can't remember exactly when it is, it's before the, it's before the war starts, it's in the midst of the uh, political battles over the Continental Association. Um, they are, people are going after people who are not agreeing to the terms in the association. Uh, and there's one incident in a tavern, of course, um, where a man is seized and marched out of town and they, they write something or they say something like, we treat them like we would paupers or lunatics. I can't remember the language exactly, but they do see these both these categories as people who are outside of being allowed into that body politic. Um, and I'm not sure how well I explain this, but the, when I'm talking about that confinement, that's one of the things, one of the big questions was, if I'm confined for madness, then I am not able to assert my rights. For John McPherson, it was, I can't take part in this process um, of being a subject or being someone who has something to say. It, it absences you from that body politic. Um, do I think differently about mental illness? Um, I think I have for a long time, ever since I started reading those medical texts back in 2011, and, and Gabe heard me talk about this. I don't know if he remembers back in 2011. Uh, it was surprising to me how different it was than I thought it would be, because I think in the process of long ago being a student and taking women's history classes, a lot of that focus is on kind of later um, ideas of mental illness and hysteria and other things. The mental illness that the doctors, doctors describe in the 18th and early 19th century, it's not that different from current day psychological texts that I have read. Um, there's a lot of parallels between but we've kind of come back to some of the, the understandings that the doctors had, and they're not all right, but we're not all right now either. There's a lot more parallels between the 18th century and 20th, late 20th, early 21st century. And then the 19th century kind of screws things up there for a while. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Gabriel says, thank you for the interesting answers. Um, I'm, I'm going to abuse the privilege of, uh, of having the microphone here to ask you another question, if you don't mind. Um, I'm interested in, and now I, I'm also sort of curious about how you kind of overlay issues of race onto this argument. Um, and one of the things that occurs to me is like, as you, as you started off talking about like this question over like, which is the crazier Great Britain or you know, the new United States, uh, under this idea of like, well, there is so much liberty and there's so much contention. That's what got me thinking about January 6th too, is like all of the, 
sort of liberty produces contention and contention produces madness, right? Mm -hmm. Then, well, you know, I, I suppose if you took that argument out to its farthest extreme, that people held in a condition of slavery could be argued to be sane, um, you know, for that reason. Is there, or like, I imagine like if you start to use this analogy or use this as a tool, you can start to see like, what about fears of hybridization, mongrelization? How does race affect all that? Do you, um, is there a way in which the, well, <laughs> I can write my own book eventually, but I'm just curious, like, how do you see that overlay like of, of race applied to this? Yeah, so absolutely. Um, it, it is, I, I do write about this um, because the doctor said, if liberty causes insanity, then people who are oppressed don't go insane. So slaves can't be insane in that um, that formula, except that there's all this colonial and early United States legislation about what do you do with insane enslaved people. Um, and so it's it is so contradictory, like everything around race um, and liberty and and ens enslavement. There's such a, a deep contradiction there because they're saying if you are oppressed, you cannot go insane, and yet they are passing laws about what to do with insane enslaved people. There are also um, in the the Pennsylvania hospital records, there are enslaved people there, um, and I I don't have answers, but I, I wrote about this just with a lot of questions because there's one incident where a woman puts her enslaved man into the hospital for insanity, and then she takes him out. I'm like, okay, if he was mentally ill, is he now sane, or does she just need him because she's throwing a ball, or was his placement in the hospital a punishment for something, right? Um, there, so race, of course, is always a question. In the post-revolution series of rebellions, there is one in, I'm going to get the state wrong now, <laughs> I, I think it's in North Carolina, where uh, there's a circuit judge riding, and he is hearing debt cases. He, there is an uprising in his courtroom, and he's unable to hear these debt cases, and he keeps wondering why the gentleman didn't step in to stop the madness of the mob. Um, and of course, one of the answers is, of course, the gentlemen don't want he, him to hear debt cases either because they have gone into debt to buy enslaved people. Um, and so they're okay with the madness of the mob as long as it serves them. And so there's just all these different elements. Um, Pre-revolution in the North Carolina regulation, um, the regulators in one of their protests actually use the, the rotting, ex, rotting body of an executed slave as part of their protest. Um, and so not just that the stuff about madness, but all the ways that the questions of lack of bodily autonomy in life or death come up, they're just there over and over and over again. Um, so it's absolutely something that I tackle. And then of course you jump into the, the later 19th century and that Southern doctor Samuel Cartwright came up with a whole new diagnosis of drapidomania, which was that slaves had to be insane if they ran away, right? So instead of this liberty loving desire for freedom, he's diagnosing them as insane. So that's kind of all over the place, but <laughs> yeah. there's all these different elements of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to pause for a moment and uh, see if that answer triggers any other questions. Well, Professor Swedberg, thank you. Um, this has been a really engaging and cool presentation. And just thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Um, I uh, want to thank all of you who have attended tonight for being here and for asking good questions and for being a, um, a great, if remote, audience. Um, I look forward to being able to do these talks in person someday. But you know, I don't think we wouldn't have been able to have this conversation if we were doing these things in person. It's, um, it's, it is really one of the great advantages.
Um, let me just give a quick pitch to, to all of you to consider becoming members of the library company. Um, becoming a member helps you to become part of the same. You can buy a share that uh, was circulating at the time of the founding of the library company almost 300 years ago. And uh, you can um, formally join this learning community that descends directly descended from, the, from Franklin's Junto. Um, and this is what we like to do. So if this is what you like to do, then join us. Um, until then, again, thank you, Professor Swedberg. I hope we get to see you in Philadelphia again sometime soon. Um, and if not, I hope we can see you again on these, uh, on these library company fireside chats. So good night, everyone. Thank you all and have a good night. Bye.